um, good afternoon all. Welcome to this uh, this discussion, which I think is going to be fascinating. Um, um, my name is Charles Metcalf. I'm one of the committee of the Circle of Wine Writers, and um, I think this is this is going to be so interesting. I, I just wanted to to tell a little story about something that happened to me many many years ago. I was invited. Um, as a wine writer, and actually the other wine writer who was invited was, was Rosemary, who is also here today. But we were both invited by um, Witch Magazine, which is a magazine that does things for consumers, to go to a rose sniffing event. And um, we were the two wine... Don't remember experts. this, Charles. I can think you remember it. Remember. Good. You know, I, it was fascinating. It just occurred to me when, when Meg started talking about what she wanted to do, talking about different ways of describing. Well, we were there. There were six of us there, six panelists. There was Rosemary and myself. There were two gardening experts. And there were two chemists, perfumiers. Um, and when, we, when it came to discussing what we thought about the various roses and their, their scents, their smells, the gardening expert said, well, it was smelly or not smelly or perfumed or not perfumed, but didn't really have any way to describe um, what they were finding it, apart from yes, good or not good. Rosemary and I used the normal terms that we would use in our wine tasting, you know, drawing on similarities to other fruits, to fragrances. And the chemists, the sorry, I should say the perfumers, they just talked in terms of chemical compounds. So here were we, three people from, six people from two, three different um, backgrounds, and we had completely different ways of, of trying to describe what we were experiencing. Um, I, just, I just use that because I'm aware that there are many different ways of describing what you think about a wine, how you find a wine, how the wine tastes, smells, to what extent do you go into how it's been made, where it's been made, um, and I think this is a discussion which, which, which Meg, I know, has already had, um, I think, over in the States with a group. And I think it's going to be fascinating for us to hear what she has to say today and then join in the discussion afterwards. So Meg, Meg is a, a very distinguished writer about wine, about food. She's a, she's a passionate um, farmer in that she and her husband have a, um, they grow their own fruit and veg, all that sort of stuff. Um, and so she has a lot of a lot of thoughts about what we should be eating and drinking and how we should do it. And Meg, please give us give us your thoughts and um, kick us off. OK, Charles, okay. thank you so much. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining. I'm, I'm really thrilled with the interest in this topic. Um, it's near and dear to my heart. I have some slides. I'm going to go through a presentation to present some of these questions and issues. Um, and then at the end, I'm hopeful that we'll have time for, for some chatting. So please, as uh, Michelle indicated, uh, first please drop questions in the chat. If there's something that's terribly confusing, if I've really gone off the rails, um, they'll be monitoring and, and you know we'll, we'll jump in so that I can clarify. But otherwise, let's just uh, plan to have a lively discussion at the end, lively if, if not. Um, Pleasant, lively, et cetera. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. So the first thing I'm gonna do is go to my presentation, presenter view. Okay, Oops. presenter view. And then go back to Zoom, share my screen, portion of screen. Okay, we can see, you can see a cover slide, everyone? Great, yeah. okay. Well, thank you again to uh, Liz and Michelle and Charles and everyone who's uh, taken time to put this together. It's I've attended many of these in the past, these uh, Let's Talk sessions. I don't know, this is number 70 something. I don't know, I think Andrea keeps track, but she's not able to join us today. Um, and they're always rich and richly rewarding for me. And I hope that I can offer something to you to give you something to think about as well. It's an, it's an honor to be of service. So, um, Without further ado, um, you know, I've been writing about wine for about 15 years and that includes a stint as a wine marketer as well. So there was some commercial, you know, stakes in the game there. I haven't done that for about 10 years, but 
really from the beginning, I've been interested in the language of wine due in part to my training in creative writing um, and also uh, from being interdisciplinary. I studied studio art and art history in the university, but also biology, botany, agriculture. I have, you know, as Charles mentioned, my own practice growing food. Um, and it's really viticulture and the culture of wine really interests me. Um, you know, vitis and culture, viticulture. I like that culture, I know it's about cultivating the soil, but I think of, I think of myself not just as a wine writer, but as a cultural observer and a cultural commentator. So my interest in the language of wine really goes back, really since I started writing about wine, these are some stories that I published, you know, they go back to like 2012, et cetera. And so, you know, I've really always been interrogating what it means to be um, doing creative production about a creative product. Um, it's this kind of a meta commentary that, that really fascinates me. And, you know, I'm complicit in the whole, you know, fruit salad tasting note thing. And I've published thousands of wine reviews in my own publication and elsewhere. Um, and I've really seen wine writing evolve in the last 15 years. And I think some of these changes are really necessary and I wanna be part of the evolution and part of the solution. Um, and when I raise this questions, these questions about the language we use and whether it's gatekeeping and whether it's Eurocentric, the reactions really fall apart into two camps. One is, this is such a big problem. And the other is, this is totally not a problem. And so to me, when you have that kind of energy on both sides, then you know that there's something there and it's something that may benefit from some work. Um, and I just wanna say, I'm not done thinking about this uh, at this point. This is just a snapshot of my work to date on this topic. So this is where we're going today. So I'm gonna talk about what is the situation? What is it, we're, we're, why are we here? Why are we talking about this? Present a brief recent history of wine commentary. Uh, as Rosemary said, you know, 50 years of commentary basically is, is where I start. Um, raise some issues that with what we're doing and maybe some questions that we should address and then present some examples, some solutions of, of how people are addressing some of these problems that have arisen. Okay. So, you know, flavor is really ineffable. Um, and that's actually partly what drives us to try to describe it, try to talk about um, flavor. And wine itself invites conversation because wine is sociable, right? Professionals like us need a lingua franca. We need to be able to talk amongst ourselves in a professional capacity and kind of inside baseball speak, right? But consumers also want to learn about wine and share their impressions. And I've taught classes in wine tasting and wine tasting terms for consumers. And I've, I've been delighted to watch a room full of passionate amateurs go from saying like, I don't know, I like it about what, what's in their glass to being able to say, well, this wine, this red wine feels more heavy and this red wine feels sort of lighter or more fruit driven to me, something like that. And really in just an hour to see them go from feeling disempowered to feeling empowered to talk about wine is really rewarding. So I've seen this firsthand. But, you know, a lot of the wine talk really, there's some murmurations about how it's really not keeping up with the times. And there's a frisson between where those consumers and the professionals meet. Um, and wine speak can be considered really elitist and exclusionary and even laughable. I mean, how many cartoons have we all seen about, you know, an insouciant little nose with, you know, abundant platitudes, like just ridiculous, right? Um, Furthermore, the vocabulary that we use in English, it tends to rest on European analogies and metaphors. And this is one of the things that most people go to directly when they're thinking about wine lexicon, but there are other issues with it as well. And it's not only Eurocentricity, I think that's the issue and we'll see some of this later. And wine education reinforces the, these approaches and these tropes and these issues then become perpetuated and propagated through the discourse because of the wine educational system and because of the professionalization of wine. And um, I think it's unfortunate, but younger consumers, people who are newer to this domain and diverse audiences in particular are, are not impressed. So in January, I led a panel discussion about this topic at a big uh, wine conference, professional wine conference in California called Wine Unify. Um, and Alicia Towns-Franken was one of my panelists. She's the executive director 
of wine unify, which is no relation to unified symposium, um, but which is aims to diversify the wine industry. She's a very experienced sommelier. She worked on the floor for many decades, uh, at a really big uh, property in Boston, and now she's a director of this nonprofit. And you know what she's saying here is that you know we tend to talk about wine in ways that actually can make people terrified, and they feel like there's a right and wrong way to speak about wine, partly because of these codified lexicons, but of course there isn't. Regine Russo is another American uh, wine educator. She's actually interesting, uh, has an interesting multidisciplinary background. She uh, grew up multilingual um, and then she is also a poet. So she brings a lot of kind of the sort of, I, you know, language kind of, she carries a lot of language, um, a bouquet of language in her head all the time, I think. Um, and, you know, she says, even if you're asking a, a consumer, you know, what do you think of this wine? What's in the glass? It can really feel like a test and that there is again a right and wrong answer and that that's that's a kind of an attitude that we have to be really be on our guard against all the time so there is money on the table here um this is data from uh, a, a, um, a study by silicon valley bank which is still going <laughs> thank god um they do this every year state of the wine industry this came out in january and it's always a sky is falling kind of kind of thing the last five or ten years and what we're seeing here is that in the US, the only segment of the market for wine consumers that's growing is over 60. So this is really an existential threat because boomers still lead all cohorts in the share of consumption. And that would be easier to tolerate if the industry were growing um, and if the cohort were growing. But you know, providing sales growth in a cohort where the median age is 66 is pretty difficult. And consumers younger than 50 drink wine, but more often drink across categories, right? So, you know, in a sizable uh, number of alcohol consumers under 50 fall into a category of people who imbibe, but not, not, not necessarily wine. And so you see this change in share, the only growing segment is older. Um, there we go. So, you know, here's just another kind of example of this. We see uh, this was a study conducted by the Harris Poll um, in late 21. We all know that 20 and 21, they were kind of unusual drinking periods, but in any case, um, we have, you know, what are you gonna take to a party? People under a certain age are not necessarily going to choose wine. It's really only the older cohort that tends to choose wine to take to a party to share with friends. Um, Hang on, Meg. I don't okay, know. No, I, I just unmuted myself now. It's okay. Thank you. Sorry about that. No worries. No worries. I need um, to put in my plugs. Um, could you all please mute, mute yourselves? No. Put yourselves on mute. Thank you very much. Thank Sorry, you. Meg. Please go no, ahead. No worries. No worries at all. Um, so again, this is a sort of another way of looking at this. Younger cohorts are choosing non-wine alcohol, basically. Um, the export market, however, in the U.S., this is exports of U.S. wine to other countries. This is a growing sector, and you can see pretty clearly that Asian markets are really, really important to us. Um, and so, again, when we start thinking about how we're talking about our wine, how we're positioning it for occasions, what kinds of food we're suggesting that we pair with it, what terms we're using, how we describe it on our tech sheets and everything else, this is a, something that we need to keep firmly in mind that these people may not be native English speakers. So here's Elisa Towns Franken again, she basically she's just stating the obvious here, we're leaving revenue on the table by not marketing to demographics that are important for us to grow, which include younger cohorts and non-native English speakers, especially people of other cultural um, origins. Erica Ducey was another person on my panel um, at, at Unified Conference. And, you know, she's, she's a very experienced wine editor. She's a content strategist. We work together at uh, the late Lamented Picks. Um, she's a terrific editor and, a, you know, really great industry voice. She's just started a new podcast called The Business of Drinks. I encourage you to check it out. Um, but she's saying, you know, language isn't the only thing we need to address, but it is one thing we need to address. And it is definitely important here. So let's step back to look at the last kind of 50 years. Like, how did we get where we are? How did we actually get here? Okay. So I was interested in, in you know, in the Judgment of Paris. So this is 1976, not quite 50 years ago, but I was interested in Tabor's report from the judges and he was kind of listening in and, 
he says that they use terms like, you know, nervous and agreeable, right? Um, good nose, but not much in the mouth. Uh, sore is out of the ordinary. You know, they're not saying it tastes like melon and cantaloupe and lemon. You know, they're not, they're not really using those kinds of descriptors. Um, and he's not reporting that either. Frank Parle had a good long run at the New York Times as a wine critic. And he was famously, <coughs> excuse me, um, derogatory toward wine speak. Um, hang on one second. I'm getting over a cold, so I'm just going to take a sip of water. So I, I rummaged through a lot of his, um, his notes from many different years, and I really struggled to find any kind of flavor descriptors at all. You know, bright and spicy, good chunky wine, I like chunky actually. Um, <clears throat> body and pronounced flavor could probably describe half of the world's wines, right? So this is not his focus. His focus is not on olfactory principally, but more on structure and then the rest of the article being much more about the wine's context. <clears throat> the OIV tasting sheet doesn't have an awful lot of space here for fruit salad tasting notes. It's rich, really much more about <clears throat> structure, typicity, overall impact, et cetera. I, there are probably some people here who use this or this is from 2021, but I am not a judge. I just wanna issue that disclaimer. Um, but again, it's really much more of kind of a condensed kind of scale here because we're not really necessarily communicating what it's like, just whether it's high quality. Emile Peinot, everybody probably knows this book, um, The Taste of Wine. I've only read it in English translation. Um, <clears throat> he was, again, he, he had very little use really for sort of a, what he think of as, you know, frivolous tasting notes. He does have a section in his book uh, where he talks about tasting, um, but it's not, it, the emphasis is not necessarily on olfactory. Good old Jancis, uh, I stumbled upon an interview with her from 97 and basically she's saying like consumers really don't need inside language. They don't need technical terms or jargon and just saying, hmm, I like it, that's really enough. I think she still agrees with this because I've seen some other comments she's made more recently about this. <clears throat> I kind of wonder about that in context of those classes that I've taught consumers, where some of them at least do want to feel like they can enter into a conversation and speak knowledgeably about what they're tasting in a way that feels like uh, understandable and, and, and well receptive. So Robert Parker burst onto the scene with the wine advocate in 1978, and his goal was really to democratize wine. He never accepted free samples, he was attempting to be the consumer reports of wine writing, and it led him to become a really trusted voice. And of course, his publication persists even now, now that he's retired and very highly respected and, and uh, much quoted, perhaps one of the most influential publications in English uh, language wine writing. And, but his purple prose was really a hit, right? So he's got, we got lavish kind of tasting notes here. And I literally just like pulled the Bordeaux book off my shelf behind me and did kind of like a needle drop and like typed what I found. Any of the, his reviews are like this. They're all they're kind of all like this, right? So <clears throat> basically we're talking about, you know, truffles, licorice, Asian spices, whatever Asian spices are, that's a kind of a dangerous one, um, et cetera. So we all know about Robert Parker. You know, fast forward, here's Sam Cole Johnson. She's a fellow circle member. She's an incredibly talented young wine writer. She writes for Jancis. Um, and, you know, I just, again, did kind of a needle drop. I just rummaged through jancisrobinson.com, found some tasting notes. This was a roundup of some Oregon Pinot Noirs that she had done recently. And, you know, she's using the same kind of approach here. She's talking about the, the, the different scents and smells and flavors. She's also introduced because she's trained. She's an MW candidate. She's trained in that, you know, the W set, medium plus, you know, fruit and oak forward things, th these terms that are a little bit more part of that canon, a little bit more professional, I'd say, uh, uh, descriptors here. Um, <clears throat> but you see how our attention, if you look back 50 years, you can see how the attention has shifted from the overall impression and character toward aromas and flavors of the wine. So we've, we've shifted the, the con from the context of the wine to really its hedonic or organoleptic qualities, right? And also we've shifted toward the personal experience of the wine. Right, so less emphasis on the cultural historical context and more toward the personal context and how it affects the drinker, him or herself. 
so as was actually being discussed as we were all joining in, there's this, and, and, and uh, I, I thought, Charles, your little story about the rose smelling was perfect because, you know, as we know, as trained professionals, there is a sort of direct chemical detection that happens, right? So when, when we smell or taste alcohol, we taste sugar, we smell volatile acidity, we're directly detecting because we've been trained and we know what these things are, we're detecting organic molecules in solution, right? Wine is 85% water, the rest is what makes it wine, you know, tannins, acids, oak, alcohol, also false, of course. So we can directly detect these. We don't need a shorthand, right? We can say this wine has acetic acid in it because we can smell it, we know it. But then the rest of it, most of it, uh, when we talk about a tasting note is metaphor and analogy. So metaphors, just taking the two examples I just showed, so the, the Parker example and the Cole Johnson example, <clears throat> on the metaphor side, we have things like explosive, muscular, rich, right, new world. These are, these are metaphorical terms that conjure, you know, they're not, you know, the wine isn't itself, itself explosive, but it's a metaphor. And then we have analogy and analogy is like, what is it like, right? So it tastes like roasted meats. It tastes like red plum. It tastes like cinnamon graham crackers. And so analogy is not surprising because when we want to know what someone else thinks of something they're eating, we say, what does it taste like? What does it smell like? So it invites, even the way we discuss wine and food, it invites analogy. So it's not surprising. I'm checking my time, 9.25, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so Ann Noble was a sensory chemist. She started uh, teaching and researching at UC Davis in 1974. And in the early 1980s, frustrated by what she see as the kind of growing imprecision of the language to describe wine, decided to develop something that she called the aroma wheel, which is really a three-tiered, <coughs> excuse me, um, three-tiered descriptor system, okay? It's arranged as a wheel. The two white uh, pieces are from her first papers about it. The colored wheel, which is licensable, so I'm only showing part of it, um, is, is the more finished product. But basically you start with like fruity and then you go, well, what kind of fruit? Well, it's tree fruit or you know, berries or something. And then well, within that, well, what is it? Is it a cherry, apricot, peach, or apple? Good luck distinguishing between apricot and peach. You know, many people can do it, not everybody. <clears throat> so she really wanted to develop something that she thought was free of hedonic and value judgment connotation. So in other words, she felt like these were sort of absolutes and that they should be detectable, right? And the way she did this was by creating reference scents, by taking <clears throat> neutral red wine, neutral white wine, and putting drops of things into the wine and saying, this is the smell of geranium. This is violet. This is blackberry. When she got to green beans, what she did is she took the water from a can of green beans and she put it in the white wine. And that was the smell of green beans, okay? So <clears throat> she defended this by saying, well, with only a few exceptions, these are all foods and things that are throughout, found throughout the world in most seasons. But if you really look at the list, I'm skeptical about some of this, right? So strawberries, violets, you know, certain kinds of these, they're not necessarily available everywhere all the time. So as wine became professionalized, the wine industry and wine educational systems started codifying these approaches, right? So here's the court of master sommelier. You can see there is a lot for nose and palate. Those are, those are the analogies, really the analogous terms. Um, but also we start getting into structure. There's the medium, you know, low, medium, medium, minus, medium, plus, et cetera, et cetera. We're all familiar with this. W set, obviously they call it a systematic approach to wine tasting. It's even more descriptors, right? And these are required on the tests. Like I've, I've had anecdotally people tell me that they didn't get an answer correct because they didn't use the correct flavor descriptor on the exam. These have been translated into other languages and are available on the W set website. However, when I looked at the languages that I speak and read, or at least read, um, it looked to me like they were direct translations. So cranberry is translated as cranberry, not recast as a more regional or local uh, fruit or, or flavor. So what we're seeing here is the birth of this hyperspecificity. So it's not enough to say citrus, <clears throat> it's gotta be lemon or lemon peel. Is it candy lemon peel? Is it lemon drop, et cetera? And even in the W set, they go far as to say, well, is it the juice or the zest, right? 
not enough to say citrus. The other thing is that this hyperemphasis on the olfactory. So again, we've gone from more the context, the general kind of what is this wine? Why is it important? Where is it from and what does it mean to what exactly does it taste like? Okay, <clears throat> versus sort of texture astringency. There's so much more. I mean, Peinot really goes into this in, in detail. I encourage you to look at that chapter in the book about tasting because there's so much emphasis on the other aspects of the wine that have a physical impact on you that aren't strictly olfactory, okay? So is this precision or is it just jargon or what is this? Like, why are we so, you know, um, fix, fixated on this? And does it help? That is an interesting question to me. Does it actually work? Is it better? Is this progress? So I started looking at what some researchers are doing and, and there are some research, uh, mostly mathematicians, linguists, statisticians and AI modelers and researchers who are looking at this question of like, well, what is this language doing? Does it help? And there is actually evidence that kind of the more words, the better. Um, Martin Klemek, who's at Oxford, <clears throat> he was doing, he's trying to offer a mathematical framework for assessing wine notes. And it does seem statistically speaking that the more precise the taster can be and the more information rich the note, theoretically that's more helpful to the consumer. Okay, so he, he does see that there is more information in more diversity of words basically is what his research found. Um, Chen, Yu, Chen Yu Yang and uh, colleagues uh, looked at 270,000 reviews in Wine Spectator. Um, <clears throat> he's a statistician. And they were trying to look at wine review descriptors as quality predictors, right? So he's using language processing techniques. And he did find that the words used are much more compelling and persuasive or have a higher score, information score from a statistical perspective than the numbers, the numbers including the price and the, the score. And then finally, Kevin Capehart, he was building on earlier work done by Coco Crum when she was at MIT. Sadly, she is no longer doing that work. She's in another part of the industry. Um, they analyzed a wine enthusiast database of 120,000 um, reviews, and they found that certain words basically correlated uh, with the prices of the wines. So, you know, you cannot imagine uh, I mean, this just makes inherent sense, right? You know, you cannot imagine Robert Parker describing the Aubryon as tasty. Like, we can't even imagine that. And so you have shorter words, playful words tend to be associated with less expensive wines, more opulent, lavish, kind of evocative words associated with more expensive wines. And also less expensive wines tend to have shorter reviews. It's kind of less to say. Scores, I mean, you know, we all know about scores. Um, you know, we're translating the subjective to an objective and, you know, critics often, unfortunately, inflate scores so that they can be the one who's on the necker, who's on the shelf talker, right? And it's sometimes all you see is the number with maybe a few little tasting notes, just a very few little tasting notes, classically delicious, fresh, simply delicious, pear and ripe peach, something like that. And so the mix of this score and this very short uh, blurb kind of convinces some consumers that a few words and a number is really all you need to say. And of course it ignores the making, the origins, the consumption and the context. This is just the modus operandi of basically every wine publication. You know. And so, um, you know, this is another, this is a great paper and I'm happy to share this with, with anybody who wants to look at it, but this is a fairly marketing centric approach to wine communications. And I think we're all complicit in it, even if we're trying to be objective in our reviews. What Andrew James is saying here is that basically these mouthwatering sensory descriptors and the scores and the way of like conveying the wine, even if the reviewer doesn't necessarily mean to do it, it's a way of selling the wine. It's a way of guiding someone toward a purchase. And Andrew Jefford, whom we all know and love, it's one of my favorite wine writers. I really, really admire him and his work. Um, you know, basically he's saying like, well, people find it useful. There's definitely something of value here, right? So let's make, make sure we keep that in mind. There's something of value here. I'm not criticizing it. He's not criticizing. There is something of value. We just need to interrogate what that is uh, and make it better. So, you know, the standard descriptors that we've all just seen, they're in English, they're aimed at English speakers, they're based on European foods and plants and flavors. 
uh, you know, behold the gooseberry, the strawberry, the blackcurrant, brioche, lavender, blackberry. These are European, right? Um, Richard Hemming, master of wine, calls it winglish, and it really doesn't easily translate. And it's important for us to be reminded that only 15 to 70 percent of the world's population speaks English. Miguel de Leon wrote a great piece in Punch magazine a couple of years ago called It's Time to Decolonize Wine. And he's a Filipino American. He's a wine director, very experienced sommelier, um, really knows what he's talking about here. He was supposed to be on my panel, but he had a, a family crisis, unfortunately, so he couldn't. But he has written and spoken extensively on this very topic. Um, you know, he has an Asian palate. He didn't grow up eating the kinds of things that he was tested on. And, um, you know, that's a problem for him. Um, it's been a problem in his wine education, and he's trying to sort of bring this to light. So really, it's all about the reference frame. Where do we put the reference frame? Do we center our descriptions and our descriptors in Europe? Maybe that's appropriate for European wine. I don't know. Um, but it's certainly appropriate for Europeans because it's, you know, if I if there's a particular kind of fruit or flavor that's abundant in my area and the wine seems to express that, I think it's perfectly acceptable to say, this reminds me of this thing. Um, and we're gonna get to that more personalization in a second. Um, but really it's all about reference frame and keeping that in mind. Dinashe Nayim Udoka is a Zimbabwean sommelier. He was an um, economic migrant into South Africa, started working in restaurants. Uh, they realized, everyone realized around him, he had a rock star palette. He started doing W set. He became a wine director, sommelier. He now has his own wine label and is making wine as well. Um, and so, you know, he, when he was studying W set, he, he had to do this sort of double work. He basically was like, well, it's like when I'm tasting Pinot Noir, what I smell is called the, is a water berry, which grows along the stream banks in my native Zimbabwe. And so I would say, okay, that's, if I smell hute, which is the water berry, then it must be Pinot Noir, which means I have to write down blackberry or something like that, right? So we're asking him to do twice the work, which is kind of the essence of colonialism, right? We're asking the, the person who's like, you know, trying to learn uh, something to do, to, do, to do twice the work. Uh, Jeannie Cho Lee has done a lot of work on this, the Asian, sort of the Asian palette project. She, uh, I encourage you to look at her website about that. Um, you know, she's saying that we have in a Asian culture and Asian cuisines, many, many different food analogies that we could be making that aren't strictly these ones from this lexicon that, you know, why, why not bacon? Why bacon when we have char siu, you know, grilled meats? Um, why not seaweed for minerality? There's many different forms of dried and and fresh seaweed that are used in Asian cooking. And I, th I think that's, I would love to know, I would love to do that tasting actually to learn from this. But at the same time, she's like, well, you know, students were asking them to learn both because you've got to get through the exams. So this is, I think, one of the problems that we need to think about the bar wine educational systems and how colonialism you know, factors into that, uh, that equation. There's also other issues too, right? Including some obviously problematic ones, um, you know, that arise from analogy and metaphor, like exotic or sexy, you know, the gendered uh, masculine feminine um, or, or arm wavy words for that matter. If we get to things like <clears throat> minerality, we've never really defined it. There's an ongoing discussion about what that even means. There's lots of sort of, even the sort of young hipster crowd talking about something being natty or funky or mousy or what have you. These are words that, a lot of consumers don't know for sure, and you'd have to be explained. Um, you know, we go back to this one, this this master term, right? Well, I have a master of arts, you know, I mean, it, 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 it doesn't have to be a loaded term, but um, Tahira Habibi is an American sommelier, and she wanted to be the first Black woman's master song. And she got pretty far along in the educational program, but she had to sit for a test that was administered by other master sommeliers and they insisted that everyone in the room, if they wanted, they had to raise their hand, if they wanted to speak, they had to raise their hand and call the person master. And for a black American to have to <laughs> be subjected to that, she was the only black person in the room. No one else stood up for her. No one else said, hey, this is so not cool. She got through the test, she aced it, but that was it for her. She was like, I'm done, not gonna go on. So, you know, the industry lost, what could have been an incredible, you know, master sommelier. <clears throat> okay, one more sip of water, excuse me. So what can we do about this? 
some of these issues? How can we address some of these issues? Not, not any one of us can take all of this on, right? What we can do is we can educate ourselves about it and, and try to like explore solutions. So I think of two approaches. <clears throat> one is diversification, right? Two-pronged approach, diversification and personalization. So by diversification, I basically mean in actively encouraging more voices in the conversation. So here's some examples of what's going on to address that. So Jane Anson, another fellow circle member, um, started a program uh, with Chinedu Rita Rosa in Bordeaux. It's called Bordeaux Mentor Week. And they bring, they have to, you have to apply, <laughs> it's a rigorous selection process. They bring a bunch of people from other parts of the globe to Bordeaux for a full immersion week. It's a subsidized uh, event so that they can learn about Bordeaux, arguably one of the most important wine regions in the world, and take that back to wherever they are working, right? So this is a, this is a way to keep Bordeaux relevant, right? Because it's not necessarily gonna stay relevant if the world, you know, moves on. <clears throat> Miriam Ahmed is a, a, she's there in the center with the light colored jeans and the dark glasses. She's a, a young, very energetic, very brilliant young woman out of works on the West Coast. Um, this is one of the many programs that she's involved in that she started. It's called Field Blends. She brings people to various wine regions. Um, basically, it's sort of like a mix up of tourism and wine education um, so that they can, you know, really kind of see boots on the ground. What, what is this wine about? Learn for themselves firsthand, get a personal experience. Erica Ducey, who is the, the person I introduced at the top of the hour, um, you know, she says basically one of the other things to diversify is we just need to hire different writers. We need more voices. So when she was working at PIX, um, she made it a point of hiring two new writers per month, <clears throat> even though it's a lot more work, especially if the person doesn't necessarily know that much about wine. Janice Williams was one of her hires. She was a pop culture writer. She'd written about um, like uh, music and uh, restaurants and things like that. And, you know, she would write an article and she'd say, well, this Malbec is great with a bang and hamburger, you know, and it's like, I wouldn't have written the story that way, but like, that's the point, right? And then, you know, there are other organizations that, um, that have sprung up that help, that are helping to diversify the wine industry, at least in the United States. I don't know about other initiatives elsewhere. And then, you know, we all have to kind of agree even within the circle, um, you know, everywhere to work from within. And the WSET did have an initiative to update its lexicons um, and that hasn't continued, the, the, the project hasn't continued. I think there hasn't been funding to continue it. So um, if this is something that you believe in and that you think is important, you know, I encourage you to work from within to raise your hand, raise the questions, become aware of the reference frame, become aware of your personal assumptions and uh, interrogate uh, what's going on. Here's Tinashe Naimudoka's wine label, Pumosha, Pumosha excuse me. Um, I love what he's done here. So you remember the Hute, the waterberry? So if you look in the lower left corner, you, you see he has a red blend, Cab Saw and Sasso. And he, he puts like in the bigger circle, the Hute, the waterberry, which by the way, also tastes like blackberry. So he's, he's centering his own taste experience and then giving the European reference secondarily. I just think this is delicious, I love it. Um, I threw this in here, it's not really a perfect solution, but I love how like de, like how thatched out this particular uh, presentation is. This is just a little local wine shop in Vermont, not very far from me. And they, they this is what they do on Instagram. Bottle shot, they got, what is it? You know, Elena Walsh's, Walsh's Schiava, which is delicious by the way. And then they have this very, very simple, very chill card. That's like their shelf talker, right? So what is the vibe? What is the weight? What fruit, food does it go with it? And what's the farming? So I think this is really genius. It's obviously different white and red, you know, gonna be citrusy or big and bold kind of things. Um, there's been a lot of work done on Asian wine lexicons. There's a, a group of sommelier that got together that did this initiative about 10 years ago. This is a licensable, purchasable little card for $20 um, that basically takes things like Viognier, Pinot Grigio, Pinot Noir, et cetera, and it lists sort of Asian flavors that you could find in the wine. It's in English, by the way. Um, there's also some other approaches being attempted with, um, with uh, to convey 
a wine, a wine's quality. Sarah Heller has won awards for this work. She was trained as a visual artist uh, at Yale, which is a great, great painting program. And she's now a wine educator. She does these paintings of what a wine tastes like. So it's a really different approach. It's not a linguistic approach at all. I'm doing another kind of thing. I'm doing visual narratives. I'm, you know, research. I visit a place. I visit a producer, in this case, Grovner. And, you know, I then I kind of spend some time drawing what I've seen and tasted. And it's not descriptive of the wine, but it's descriptive of the place and people. Um, and I'm, I'm getting close to the end here, so bear with me. Um, Alicia Achayo has a, a little gig. She calls herself the wine linguist. And she's really talking about, you know, let's, let's try to focus on personal experiences, personal connections, and let's invite people to use their own sensory memories, their own experiences, put their, their response to something in their own words. You know, if I say this smells like my grandmother's linen closet, that means something to me. It may be evocative to you, but I can then use that as a jumping off point to, 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 to open a story about what that, what that means to me. I think it's just as super important to develop a voice as a wine writer. I mean, I think all of us on this call are communicators in some way, I believe. And, you know, I've thrown up here some people, I think that they have very distinctive voices. Each of these people on this slide, you may or may not like what they have to say or their perspective or what have you, but there is no question when you're handed a Terry Thies catalog, you know that's his voice. He is unmistakably in that, in that text, right? But also a beat, a style, a point of view. I mean, Alice Firing, you know, everybody knows what Alice Firing stands for, right? She's absolutely clear about what she believes to be true and how she says it. You know, I'm trying to do this myself, right? I don't want to dwell on myself, but, you know, I'm trying to like center on my own subjectivity, not assume that uh, everyone knows what, uh, you know, a certain flavor tastes like, not assume that everyone knows um, the difference between a peach and a pear, not assume even everyone knows what tree fruits mean. Um, I'm trying to develop my own personal vocabulary, but also pursue the visual storytelling as well. And then have dialogue. I mean, that's one of the reasons I'm having this conversation with you today or making this presentation and hopefully we'll have time for a little chat here. So about quarter of, um, because I think it's a really important thing to talk about and I'm not done learning about it. And I'm gonna, just gonna end, I'm gonna give Tamlin Curran the mic at the end here. Um, you know, she's like, we allow a diversity of literary styles. Why not the way we describe a wine? Um, it just makes it more rich. Um, we can reach more people and the world is big enough. It's not a zero sum game. Oh, that's it. Well, that was absolutely brilliant. Stop sharing. Uh, Meg, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank it's you so much. That's a lot to think about. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess so. I mean, I think I did throw a lot at you, um, but, uh, but I wanted to kind of show, you know, what the thinking I've done. And I, I think I've tried to like push on a lot of different research threads, you know, not just explore one aspect of this. Um, because again, I think people have focused a lot on this decolonializing or decolonizing <clears throat> idea. And I think that's part of it. But I really think that it's that, that personalization is that next, that next step, because yes, if this tastes like a strawberry to me, I'm going to say it tastes like strawberry. And I'm not, I don't want to not say that. And I don't want to discourage people from saying, I don't want to discourage Tanashi Namudoka from saying, this reminds me of Hute. Because then I can say, well, why? What does that mean? What, tell me about that. Where does that grow, et cetera? It opens as opposed to closing. So anyway, maybe there's some questions. Um, I know Chast Chastity Cooper. Hi, Chastity. Thank you for joining. Yeah, and and uh, yeah, Alicia Towns Franken, that's ATF. Um, <laughs> she is a pretty amazing person. Um, and right. someone posted the Jared Bassett Foundation as well, which I don't know about. So Charles is going to go. Yeah, well, I was just going to say that yeah. Neil right. um, asked one question. He said, aside the, from the WSET exams and such, what do you see as impediments to inviting more diverse language? Yeah, Neil, do you want to come on? Do you want to unmute and? Sure. Well, you, I think some of you know my opinion about some of the language that's uh, regarded as offensive, but um, 
to me, when uh, and and I, I I thought you did a, a splendid job in laying out the the breadth and width of the issue. But uh, as I'm trying to sort through where the problem is, it, it seems to be that if you wanna if you wanna get that certification, then there's a uh, compulsion to use a, a fixed set of language. Personally, I think all of that is, is nonsense and not necessary. So if you take out from the discussion, the need to get this certification, WSET or whatever else, what other things are going on, at least from your point of view or anybody else's point of view, that keep people from describing things the way they want to? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I've observed, and I'm sure I have unknowingly participated in um, behavior where, um, you know, you shut someone down. Someone says, well, this tastes to me like this, or this isn't this, or I don't get whatever. And you say, well, of, of course it's like this. You know, there, there's a sort of a, um, I think that just a, there's an entrainment that, that I, I know I, I acquired. Um, and I think that, you know, I've seen in staff trainings, in other kinds of formats that aren't formal educational, um, where there clearly is being telegraphed the idea that there is a right answer, that this wine is like this, not I have an experience of this. And so I think it's really about shifting our mindsets as professionals and how we approach a conversation. Um, so I'm, I'm on the line. I, I sell wine in a, in a tasting room. And the one thing I never do, and we don't in the tasting room, is tell somebody what they're supposed to taste. Um, we don't, uh, sometimes people hand out a card that has a description of a wine, which is, of course, BS. And uh, I mean, I have issues with tasting notes anyways. But we're, this is not my talk. This is your talk. Um, so one of the things we do tell people is to trust your palate and basically decide whether or not you like it. Um, I, I had a really, I had a really interesting discussion about uh, two weeks ago with somebody who kept dropping the M word, you know, minerality, and I have no idea what that word is. I've written extensively about how it's utter BS, and yet this guy seemed to. To hinge on it. So I said, okay, look, if the word is BS. Tell me what it means to you. And he said, basically, uh, what was the equivalent of funky, which is another one of those words. <laughs> it turns out we had a wine that uh, a, a 13 white rose vineyard, which is funky to my thing. I said, hmm, try this. And he said, yeah, that. And I, you know, sold him a bottle, sold him a bottle of a 13, sold him a bottle of 11. From just that little discussion where I, I delved into what he thought a word meant, I was able to connect with him, although I, you know, don't agree that if there is such a thing as minerality, it's funky. But we, we made a connection. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's uh, a great example. I mean, I think that's really yeah. what I'm talking about, is really trying to connect in a way that doesn't assume that we understand each other. Because again, uh, flavor is really ineffable. Um, See, I don't so, even think it's Eurocentric. I think it's human-centric. Um, we each taste and, and sense different things. The label that we use on it is is. Yeah. Well, I think we're saying the same thing, Neil, because I think that the, the established lexicons that are tested on, and if you want to start in the wine industry and you want to get your W set, we professionalize the industry so that newer, wine professionals have to go through the curriculum. I think forcing people to learn certain terms and testing them on that when they've never tasted those things and it doesn't actually have any association to them. You know, you'll write, people will write gooseberry for Sauvignon Blanc without really knowing. They just know that they're supposed to, that it's Sauvignon Blanc, so they're supposed to write gooseberry. Yeah. And I'm, ta I'm advocating yeah. for personalization. So I think Keith, Keith, you had a question. Keith, well. Yes, Keith, you wanted to create, Keith Granger. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Max, for a fantastic presentation. I'll, I'll move on from what Neil was saying. I think one of the challenges we face is that too many wine writers and critics claim to be objective. Mm -hmm. Now, to my mind, 
with objective taste that does not exist. We're all victims of history, of education, of culture, and that comes out. So, for example, um, the way a critic from Burgundy might describe a Montrachet well, would be completely different to one from California, um, who's um, never lived that life, like they to use the modern jargon, their lived experience. And I think one of the problems with all the education platforms, uh, they try to put things into tight parameters all the time. And in fact, wine is much more beyond that. Wine is, of course, art. There's a fascinating book by um, Manuel Malpeta Ferreira and Virgilio Luero, professors at University of Lisbon, um, mastering the art of enjoying wine from enology to enosophy. And what they're saying is that wine should be assessed emotionally, give up all pretense of trying to assess objectively. And here comes the problem, of course, that if you claim to be objective, you believe that your descriptors are the descriptors. And when somebody doesn't see that, then they do feel, as Meg started off with, feel all at sea. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Keith. I don't have anything to add. I think that's terrific. Anyone else questions? Uh, Winnie, you just mentioned this uh, an initiative that was just written about in Jansus, actually. Um, Melu Lambert did this great article on this effort in South Africa to do a Chenin Blanc uh, aroma wheel in three different languages, Josha, Shonu, and Shona and Zulu. Um, which, yeah which just highlights how right. much work there is to do. I mean, that's just one grape. I mean, it's very important to South Africa wine, obviously, but um, do you have a, any other things to add about that, Winnie? Well, you know, we've got a, a, a much bigger um, black middle class that are all drinking wine and, and more um, bespoke, shall I say, um, South African wines and trying these wines. And, and then with the descriptions, that are on the bottle, as you say, or on the on the on the note in the in the shop, um, or indeed by the person who's trying to sell it to them, uh, is not things that they're familiar with. And with those three uh, groups of, as you said, uh, Shona, Isizula, and Isikosa, they've they 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 found familiars of those um, languages and those backgrounds to describe the words in, in, in the way that they would understand it, to actually open up this world of wine to more people and to make it more user-friendly and understandable. Because it's also for me, sometimes similar to, to the name of a wine where people would be very reluctant to order a wine if they can't pronounce the name or they can't pronounce the, the producer. So they rather move on to something else where they actually do understand. So that is all part of this for me in any event, but the the um, the feedback from Melu's um, article and, and the work that's being done by the association has been phenomenal. And people are now seeking out those Chenin Blancs with the, with the descriptors in their own language. And I think that's fabulous that we're actually just drawing in people by speaking to them in their own language. Uh, so, and I agree with you. It seems you. so simple uh, and obvious, right? But but it's it's like taking so long to get there. Exactly. Um, and so why should you be penalized in an exam if you don't use the word, i.e. gooseberries, when you've never tasted one or seen one? Um, and that's that was a problem for, for, for me in the beginning when, when I started learning about wine, because a lot of the things were uh, in the English, 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 so to speak, like, Loganberries. We don't get Loganberries in South Africa. So how must I know what a Loganberry tastes like or a slow uh, plum or whatever when I've never tasted it before, even seen what it looks like? So so it's not only the black community, it is also just another um, country and um, and background. Hmm. It's, it's cultural. Cultural, yeah. exactly. Yeah. exactly. It's cultural. It's not assuming that, I mean, Shana, obviously, we know where it came from. It came from Europe. Um, but it's, you know, it's it's an important part of South African wine culture now. And and to assume that you write the Shana tasting note from South Africa, South African Shana, the same way you'd write one from the Loire, it doesn't, 
make any sense. It just doesn't make any sense. (laughs) You know, I think that's sort of where I come back to is it like, let's, let's, the idea is for someone to enjoy the wine and to know that they might enjoy it. Um, Not to, not to assert the primacy of the wine itself. The wine itself is not the thing. It's the experience of the wine that's the thing. And also the confidence. Sorry, to, sorry, 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 uh, Michelle. It's also the confidence of the person who actually bought that wine to introduce it to their friends, because they can they can explain it to a wider audience in in just one little sitting in one bottle and one bunch of friends sitting together drinking it together, um, and that's how this education process starts. And I think that's that's fabulous. Yeah, there's been some other great comments here. Um, yes. I love your comment about you were told you could not use cinnamon in relation to white wine ever. <laughs> so yeah, so that yeah, you do lose marks, right? I mean, that's that's the there's an economic aspect to this as well for young wine professionals or new or wine professionals. I don't want to age us, you know, be ageist here, but but I you know I think that that's there's job jobs and money on the line for people who are trying to learn in advance and and and. You know, I, I just, I have problems with other parts of formal education too. Don't get me wrong. It's not just, you know, wine lexicons that bother me about this. I think personalizing, I, I, I don't really love standardized tests, even though I got good at them, but it's sort of like a party trick, isn't it? That you can pass a test. You memorize something and pass a test. A lot of people can't memorize things. It's just not the way their brain works. And yet they could be an incredibly powerful wine professional. So we need to, we need to work with people's brains and work with their own cultural the baggage that they bring because again the wine isn't the thing it's the person that's that's more important than the wine anybody yes. else questions going back to one of your points questions. right at the beginning meg i'm sorry but someone else trying to speak going back to one of your questions about this this decline in young people drinking wine and the necessity for the wine industry to try to find some way of of making wine more exciting for younger people. What what are your thoughts about that? Yeah, well, I'm not a wine economist, but I do I do see that um, the younger cohorts are very exploratory and they're experimental, and they do not respond well to like received wisdom. You know, established the establishment and the received wisdom of like you must love wine because wine is a sophisticated drink. And therefore you must learn to love wine when you're young so that you can be sophisticated later. Like that's basically how it was all presented in the seventies and eighties. And the millennials and, and the younger generations are just, they, they just don't buy it. Like, sorry, like I'm gonna drink what I want and you know, pour me a taste. They're really experimental. And so they canned cocktails, uh, hard seltzer, you know, ready to drinks, cocktails in general. Um, they're very exploratory. And so can we make discovery of wine exciting. I, I believe in wine as a great, it's a great beverage. I believe in the product, it's an agricultural product. I'd much rather people, if they're going to drink alcohol, choose wine versus, you know, malt liquor, um, which I don't see as having much redeeming cultural value. That's just my value judgment. Um, so can we make wine exciting and interesting and accessible to these people? And how can we do that? That's really up to the marketers. I know there's one or two of them on the call and I would leave that to their genius minds. Um, but I really do think it's about making it attractive in, a, in an exploratory and experiential sense, as opposed to making it seem like an uh, ossified uh, cultural artifact that everyone must learn to respect, which it just isn't going to fly. Well, I think that was great, Meg. Um, I know we could talk uh, and there could, you know, could be much more discussion on this. And there's so many comments uh, on the chat. So it has been very thought provoking and you've presented it extremely well. And I'd like to thank you very much on behalf of us all. And.